It's a great privilege to have Pastor Turner here, and many of you that are here know that Pastor Turner is the pastor that founded our church uh, 1974, July 7th, and uh, he was our first pastor at the start of the church, and we really appreciate his ministry, and now he is out of our church as a full-time evangelist, and it's a great blessing to have a part of his ministry now. We, he's thanked us for being a part of his ministry, but we're thankful that he's out there standing for the stuff, standing on the Word of God and preaching the Word of God. And churches out there today need to hear God's Word preached. And so we appreciate his ministry, and I love him very dearly. It's always a blessing to have him with us, and we're so happy to have him here today. Preacher. Thank you, Pastor. It's a blessing to be here. Am I on here, brother? I am. Hello, hello. There it is. It's that little standby switch, Brother Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank the Lord for the privilege of being back. I have to watch myself. I always want to say Baptist Temple. You know, when you're here 15 years and you're saying Baptist Temple, Baptist Temple. But whether it's Baptist Temple or it's Lighthouse Baptist Church, it's God's church, that's all that really uh, is important to me. But it's good to be back and good to see uh, some old friends. And when I say old friends... Uh, <clears throat> It's interesting how uh, some are getting a bit older. Somebody said, Preacher, you, you look really good. I said, I've been told that's the final stage before death. <laughs> you look really good. And, uh, and then, you know, at the funeral they say, doesn't he look good? I've never thought anybody dead looked good. They, they all look bad to me. I, you say, Preacher, are you afraid to die? I'm not at all afraid of death. Death is no enemy to a child of God. Amen. But the croaking part, I'm not too excited about. I mean, the eh, 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 last part, you know what I'm talking about? I've watched thousands of people go through that. I'm not really looking forward to that. My dad used to say, I'd much rather uh, be part of the rapture, the upper taker, than to have to deal with the undertaker, amen? And so uh, hopefully that's what'll happen. Uh, I just buried my mother four weeks ago, and uh, she was sure she was going to be here for the rapture, but... I'll tell you, she's with the Lord now, and she won't have to worry about that at all. It's a good thing to know the Lord. It really is. Good th I said it's a good thing. Now listen, I'll preach to the stinking choir if I have to again tonight. Uh, and by the way, where were some of you during the week? We got a full crowd, but uh, a little puny the last couple of nights. Preacher, uh, preacher I think, uh, would have liked to have seen some of you. Uh, when you have special meetings, try to make those meetings because... The church is a body, B-O-D-Y. And when you're not here, uh, it means a leg's missing, an arm's missing, something's missing, and you need to all be in the house of the Lord. Well, you didn't think I'd come and not lecture you, amen, that's what I do best. But anyhow, it's good to be with you today. Hope you'll all stay for lunch. If there's not enough food, we'll share ours with you. And uh, just have some good fellowship together. Take your Bibles and turn... Uh, to 2 Corinthians 8. While you're turned there, I want to say how thankful I am for the ministry of Brother Carney and Miss Lynn and, uh, and also for uh, Brian and Amanda uh, and their hard work here. And boy, does he work hard. And uh, I mean just constantly. And for all of you who are faithful members of this church and those that have stayed by the stuff all these years when it would have been easy to leave, thank you for staying because... Uh, there's a lot been invested here. I was 24 years old when I uh, started this work. Dumber than a duck. And who said that? Carol Moore. I can tell stories now, so be careful. I remember the first time we had a fellowship at Vinnie De Polo's. And we were eating, and Chad picked up a little car and stuck it in his pocket. And Carol said, no, 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 put that up. We're saved now. We can't steal anymore. <laughs> You'd forgotten about that, huh? No, you hadn't forgotten. So you better be careful now. I still remember some stories. And I'll tell them if you give me any trouble. I will. All right, would you stand with me as we read the Word of God this morning? 
I'm so glad for this church because it hasn't given up its doctrinal stand. In a day when everybody is gravitating towards churches where you come as you are, you be whatever you want to be, we're not going to judge anything, but the Bible's full of judgment. I, I, I laugh when people come up to me and say, you know, the Bible says judge not lest ye be judged. I said it also says judge righteous judgments. So you don't judge things you don't know about, but based on what you do know and what Scripture says, we make righteous judgments. And, uh, and that's biblical to do so. In fact, Jesus gives examples of that uh, when he speaks, you know. And, uh, and so I'm thankful that this church has just stood by uh, the stuff, and I encourage you, stand with your pastor. This is not an easy day uh, to uh, plant churches, to build churches. Uh, our society in general is gravitating away from the things of God and becoming more self-gratified and self-sufficient, and it's just a hard day. So uh, there needs to be a bright uh, light in the midst of all of the darkness, so be faithful uh, to, the, to your church. Second Corinthians chapter 8, and uh, we're in a stewardship conference. Somebody said, what's a stewardship conference? Well, we're talking about how uh, to be giving in our relationship with God, giving in our time, giving in our talent, and giving in our uh, tithe. And we're learning some principles. I've actually only gotten through one of them, but by the time we're done this afternoon, and it'll be a brief service, I know, this afternoon, but I'll get through all five of these principles uh, uh, that will help you to uh, be a good steward of your life and all that you are uh, for the cause of Christ. So let's read beginning in chapter 8 and, and verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty uh, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you uh, the same grace also. Now look up here. We're talking about the grace of giving. The grace of giving. And he said, the goal is that as you're being instructed, you would learn to allow God to use you in the grace of giving. Verse uh, number uh, 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in your faith and utterance and the knowledge that you get, in all diligence, and that is carrying out what you've learned, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. In other words, see that while you're growing in the faith, while you're learning to love more, while you're learning to be diligent in everything that you do, also learn how to be a giver. Can I just say this and then we'll pray together and look at the message. We're living in a day of takers. We're living in a day when everybody thinks that everybody ought to take care of me and, uh, and everybody's wanting everything given to them. But God wants us to be not takers but givers. God wants us to have a heart that is always saying, how can I be used of God to further the cause of Christ? How can I be a good steward of the things that God has given me? I'm always in my life, my wife will bear witness to this, looking not for a way to close up my billfold, but a way to extend uh, my giving and be a better giver than I've ever uh, given before. That's what we're going to talk about this morning and again this afternoon. And someone's going to accuse, I know I hear it already, oh, all these Baptists ever talk about is giving. Well, let me just say, this is a one-time-a-year conference, and let me also say that if you'll listen, I think you'll see that everything I'm going to say is going to come right out 
of the Word of God. And may I just say this, if God says it, good on us, amen? Good on us. We ought to just do it, accept it, and, and uh, be faithful to it. Father, we ask you to bless uh, this morning. Lord, I know that I uh, have nothing that I can add to the day. I, I know I'm a sinner saved by the amazing grace of God. And Lord, uh, I don't pretend this morning to be anybody except that sinner saved by grace and, and the man that's been called to declare your word. And I ask this morning that you'd help me as I preach the word of God, use me in a powerful way. And Lord, I pray for someone here today uh, that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. This would be the day they'd come to know him, whom to know is life everlasting. And I thank you, Lord. Uh, and I would gratefully thank you again and again if you'd save somebody today. That's why this church was begun in 1974. Uh, not to just have numbers or uh, have buildings, but to declare that Jesus saves sinners from their sin and gives them a home in heaven. So honor us with salvation today, but honor us also with surrendered hearts that would be a good stewards of everything that you have given to us We'll be careful to give you praise for whatever is accomplished, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you've been here during the week, you know that I have been talking about the principle of stewardship and using the example of the Macedonian churches uh, that are recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Now, maybe you do or maybe you don't, know the, the background of these Macedonian churches, but God says in chapter 8 here, and verse 1, I want you to wit of the grace of God, or I want you to take knowledge of the grace of God that God has bestowed upon these Macedonian churches. And then he describes in great detail, and I'll just give you a thumbnail of it because we want to get to principles number two and three uh, during this hour. But uh, God says, I want you to take wit of or take knowledge of what these churches have uh, been able to accomplish and uh, what they've done for God, the stewardship of of these churches, their giving. I, and I, I think it's important. Are you hearing me this morning? I think it's real important that when God says, take knowledge of this, that we take knowledge of it, amen? That we look at it and we ask ourselves, what is it that God wants us to see in this? So much that he would say, hey, take knowledge of this. Take a look at this. This is what they did. And I want you to abound in that same grace also. Now this church, these Macedonian churches, were going through, the Bible says, great affliction. I talked about that in each service. I'm not going to belabor that in this service. But let me just suffice to say, they were under constant persecution. They were under constant difficulty. I don't think our churches are experiencing that today, albeit I think that we're headed in that uh, direction. You've been following the IRS scandal uh, the uh, persecution of right-wing so-called uh, groups. Uh, most of those were uh, religious groups like Dodson and other guys, and they were being persecuted because of their religious beliefs and required to answer questions like, uh, what is your opinion about this? And what is your opinion about that? Well, there is this thing called the First Amendment in America that says we have the right of religious freedom and the freedom of speech, and that is whether it is considered conservative speech or liberal speech. Amen. We have the right for freedom of speech. By the way, do you know that it was a Baptist who caused that to come about? James Madison uh, in the Virginia Baptist. They were being persecuted and it was a result of that that he led forth in the process of the First Amendment uh, to the Constitution of the United States that gives us liberty or freedom of speech. So I'm just saying we're not persecuted like these churches were persecuted. They were under a continuous barrage 
of persecution. But I will say this. Are you listening this morning? There are some things on the horizon here. They're coming. If you hold positions that are biblical and you're not ashamed of those, that persecution is coming. And so God is preparing us, I believe, to be good stewards even in the middle of persecution or affliction. But not only that, we see in verse 2, they were in deep poverty. Now, I listen, I've, I've traveled literally uh, from the west coast uh, to the southeast and from the northeast to the southwest and uh, foreign countries and everywhere I go I hear the same thing. Oh my, the economy's so bad. And then I pull up at the church and I see the BMWs and the Lexus and I see all those things. And I just want to tell you, I don't think we're suffering quite as bad as most of us think we are. It's just that we got to have two cars and we got to have two houses and we got to have all of these things. Some One great preacher said this, things are given to us that we might have dominion over them, but the reality is those things have taken dominion over us. Amen? And, and so uh, we are cry. I hear people crying everywhere. Oh, you don't know how bad it is. Well, I'm, I'm going to get, can I give you all a little prophecy here? And I'm not meaning as a prophet, just what I see on the horizon. I think you have not seen anything yet to what is going to happen in, in order for the end days to come about. Are you listening to me? There's got to be a total collapse of our economy. That's on the way. Uh, even those in high office are starting to say that collapse is on the way. It has to happen because there has to be a one world economy during the tribulation period. Now thank God we're going up before that. Amen. But I'm saying things can be getting rough in the future. And we've got to decide. Uh, somebody asked me this the other day. You know, they're talking about now redoing the tax code and taking away the deduction that you get when you give charitably to the church. And I said, uh, you know what? That won't affect my giving because I know what God's told me to do. And I'm going to give to my power. Amen. I'm going to give what belongs to God. But it will affect the giving around the country with those that have not settled this matter of stewardship in their life. Now, so they were in deep poverty uh, and, and they were in great affliction, but I like what God said about this church. Look at verse 2. They also were rejoicing in the abundance of their joy. You know, some of the happiest Christians I've ever met were in countries that were just absolutely poor. I mean, they had absolutely nothing. I've worshipped with uh, the Africans in Africa, and I'll tell you, they are blessed Christians, and they, they don't have anything. I remember saying once to uh, one of the pastors there, Pastor, I want to go home and talk to my church and see if I can raise a little money and come back and build you a little small house. I'll never forget him put, uh, putting his hand up immediately and saying, Oh, Pastor, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. He said, I would never want to live any differently than my people. They all were living in mud huts. And, and he said, I would never want to live any differently than, him, than them. He said, if you want to help us, help us to build a church building where we can bring people uh, in and preach to them the gospel uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've been all around the world. I, I've been in India, some of the poorest places in India, uh, where the little children uh, have absolutely nothing. And they, they literally, I went into one room and, and they were, the toes of one were touching the heads of the others. They were so crammed into that little building. But they were happy in the Lord Jesus Christ because they were trusting in God and not in things. Come on, help me out here just a little bit. I'm telling you we are a spoiled nation and most of us have plenty and yet we are always trying to keep what we've got and not willing to give like God has ordained in the Bible that we give. And I'm not talking about money only. I'm talking about our life and I'm talking about our time. And I'm talking about our, our talents and being used of God to do whatever uh, God would want us to do. And so we talked about the condition of these churches and then we talked about the challenge that God gave them. Gave them, And I'll get caught up with myself here in a minute. Verse 3, he said, For to their power, you might want to circle that little word to, to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. So look up here, to their power, they did what they could and beyond their power, they did uh, allow, allow God to do what they could not do. So the challenge of the week has been this, to learn to do what you can with what God 
has given you. Now here's what I'm saying. The principles of giving demand that we just accept the Word of God as true and we do what God commands us to do. Amen? We do what God tells us to do. But there are things in our life that God will challenge us to do that we cannot do on our own. We must have the help of God. It must be divine intervention in our life. It must be beyond anything uh, that we can recognize that we can do ourselves. So we can give to our power. That's those things we have within our own um, life. And we can obey God and we can give our tithes and we can give our offerings and we can give our time and we can give our talent but there are some things God may demand of us that we can only give by God bringing it in external to our own resources are you still with me here now and so I've given uh, started to give five principles that will help us to learn to give beyond our power and the first one we covered was this the principle of personal surrender may I just say this this morning I find a lot of stubbornness in churches around America. I find a lot of people who have this kind of an attitude. I'll do what I want to do. I'll go to church when I want to go to church. I'll obey the Word of God if it's convenient for me to obey the Word of God. I'll live the way I want to live. Even though I know what the Word of God says, I'm going to be the Lord of my own life. In Jeremiah chapter 2, the Bible talks about the people of Israel and says that they had done three things that was terribly sinful. Number one, they had prostituted themselves by setting up altars all around the country and worshiping false gods. Number two, the Bible says they elevated themselves. And here's what they did. They said, you know what? We are lords of our own life. In other words, they determined, you know what? Nobody is going to tell me what to do. I've been preaching 46 years, and I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody's got up in my face and said, Pastor, you're not going to tell me what to do, even though I'm preaching the Bible. You're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to control my own life. Did I get an amen back there? I think it did. Uh, I'm going to control my own life. I'm going to do what I want to do. No preacher's going to get up and tell me how I've got to live my life. And I just tell them, listen, the Bible commands me to preach the Word. It's not that I want to tell you. It's God said tell you. Amen. And I'm going to be faithful to that. And I'm going to preach the Word of God. But listen, I'm in church after church after church where people struggle with doing what God said. Why? Because we want to maintain authority over our own life and so they said listen we are lords we will make our own determination listen to this I've been sparring with one of my nephews who I, I don't even know how to describe him uh, I guess he would uh, say he believes there's a God uh, but then when I try to quote scripture to him he'll uh, he'll tell me I don't believe all that stuff and so I said to him so you don't believe the word of God well don't judge me and so I wrote back and said, well, uh, I'm glad to hear you do believe the Word of God. Well, since you're now asking me, I'll tell you I don't. And I said, so what is truth? And he said, truth is whatever you want it to be. Now let's consider that a moment. If truth is whatever you want it to be, are you all listening to me this morning? Oh, you kind of got, kind of got a goofy look on your face. So I don't know. What, just stay with me here now. Uh, listen, listen. If truth is what you want it to be, and there are 7 billion people in this world, then that kind of translates to there's 7 billion sets of truth. And so can you imagine the chaos of trying to live when nobody knows whose truth we're going to live by? Amen? And so I say, let's live by the word of the living God. Amen? Let's learn to follow uh, the commands of uh, the word of God. And so I just, uh, he said to me, well, you know what your problem is? You just believe whatever the Bible says. Well, I plead guilty to that. I do believe what the Bible says. And the Bible says, look at me, the first principle is personal surrender. The Bible says, ye are not your own. You don't own yourself. You have been bought with a price. You are to glorify God your heavenly Father who bought you in your spirit and in your flesh, in your life, you are to 
honor God with all of your substance. There comes a time, please listen to me now, when every one of you must decide, will I submit myself to God's authority or will I continue to run my own life and be Lord of my life? And we're in a society today that says if it feels good, do it. And whatever you think, where our churches are touchy-feely, trying to make everybody happy, not preaching against sin, not trying to get people to leave their old lives and follow the dictates of the Word of God, because no one wants to commit themselves totally to God. They want to have control of their own life. But I say to you, if you're going to be a giver, a steward of God that will be pleasing to God, you must come to the place of total surrender in your life where God becomes the Lord of your life. Your opinion doesn't matter. I hear people say all the time, well, I think, I don't care what you think. I personally don't think God gives a flip for what you think. The rules have been written down. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And we just need to submit to his word and to his authority. Can somebody say amen? I mean, I'm thinking that that's the right doctrine. It's right out of the Bible. Number two. Finally got to principle number two. Principle number two, the equality of sacrifice. The first one was the principle of personal surrender. Chapter 8, verse 3, 5, 11, 12, and 19. Uh, the second principle is the principle of equality of sacrifice. Look with me in verse 12 of chapter 8. For if first there be a willing mind, notice that willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want and their abundance also may be a supply for your want uh, that there may be a what? An equality. Now notice here that this equality comes directly on the heels of a willing heart, a willing mind. Someone has already, look at me, already determined God is in control. I'm willing to do it your way. Now I gave you the illustration and I, I want to see if I can illustrate this uh, to help you this morning. Uh, I retired from pastoring. I thought I had all of my ducks in a row and retirement all set up and everything. We'd worked hard uh, to do that. Suffice it to just simply say, it didn't happen. None of it happened. I, I found Miss Turner and I and uh, and uh, our daughter and her husband and kids had determined we would move back to my home state of Indiana. Oh, yay, back home in Indiana. I love it. But anyhow, uh, with the cows and the chickens and all of that. And so we moved back. But because all of that fell through, the only thing I could do was, and thanks to the gratefulness of Pastor who got behind me and, yeah. and tried to encourage me to hang in there, uh, we, we got about, I think, maybe six churches that support us monthly, including this one, that at least helped buy some groceries till we got through this trial. But here, I, here we are. Are you all listening to me now? Yeah. Here we are, uh, sitting in a basement apartment after 43 uh, years at that time, for almost 44 years of serving the Lord. We're sitting in a basement apartment, and nothing uh, is, uh, is going the way it ought to go. Amen. Nothing is really flowing. And I'm at a point where I'm saying, what is going on here? I even said to my wife, what is God going to allow next? She said, shame on you. One day while she was gone, I was just down in the basement praying. Are you all hearing me now? I'm just down in the basement praying and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm thinking this morning of those Africans there in Africa and sleeping on that cold floor in that mud hut. And I'm thinking, Lord, you know, if I'm no better than they are. And so, Lord, if you want me in a mud hut and a cold floor, uh, or if you want me in this moldy basement here in Indiana, whatever you want in my life, I submit myself to that today. I have a willing heart. I'm willing to do that. I don't deserve anything. I'm just thankful for your goodness in saving my soul. Are you all with me now? So I got that first principle down, right? The willing heart personal surrender. I've told this story. I had no more said amen, Lord. I'm sorry. Amen. Then my cell phone rang. 
And someone called me and said, Pastor Turner, I heard you're living in an apartment. Do you think God might have been watching me where I was? So, excuse me. This is a test. Do you think God might have been watching me right where I was? And the minute I got that right with God, and the minute I got the personal surrender of my life right, God began to intervene in my life. And this man said, I don't want you living in an apartment. And I said, there's nothing I can do about it. And he said, but there is something I can do about it. And he said, I want to provide you the money to buy a place. Have you looked for something? I said, we have. He said, you go sign a contract and I'm going to pay for your home. Now hang on. I said, well, I need to pray about that. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I did pray about it. And the, the Lord spoke to my heart. And my wife agreed that we would take it. But we'd take it as a loan. So somewhere down the line, someone else can have that money. And it'll be a blessing uh, to them. And so we called. I called a preacher that night to get counsel. And I said, this is what I think the Lord wants me to, to what I think he wants me to do. He said, you're crazy. Take the money. Well, if you're amen and you got it, just give it to me. I'll take it now. Amen? So, so now, cheaper than y'all can even buy a rental up here. We're living on 42 acres and I got five cows and, you know, five stray cats, a bunch of dogs running around, a bunch of ornery grandkids. But you know what? God supplied that because of getting that personal surrender right. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. And then God says, I want you to give by equality. Now here's what God said. You, this church is blessing the other churches. But I don't want them to carry the whole load. At some point, I want these churches over here to learn what you've just learned and to learn that even in a great trial and even in deep poverty, I want them to learn they can have the grace of giving also and I want them to help others. Are you still with me? You know what I, you know what I have noticed in Baptist churches? And listen, I, I, I went off to a Baptist church when I was five days old. Uh, I've been in a Baptist church all my life and I can tell you it's always been the same. All the years I pastored as a senior pastor, 38 years in Baptist churches. And I can tell you that I have found that about 10% of the people do about 80% of the work around the house of God. It doesn't matter what's going on. I mean, it's kind of like this meeting this week, and I'm not scolding anybody. Uh, but look at this crowd this morning. Where were you Friday night and Saturday night? I, you know, it's a matter... No, I'm serious here. It's a matter of stewardship. You know, the church is a body. And the body is to equally function in the work of the church. Somebody ought to help me here. Even some of you who didn't make the meeting ought to help me here because I'm telling the truth. Now, I'm at that age where things are not working like they used to work on my body. In fact, some of you probably saw me last night. I was walking along here and I lost my leg right about here. And thank God for these pews. But I, I, here's what I found. I found there mornings I get up and my body wants to get up, but parts of my body does not want to join the rest of my body. I've had two major back surgeries, and my back's pretty messed up, but, and the last one damaged my uh, spinal cord, and my legs are numb, and my feet don't work well. And Sometimes I, I was starting to get up the other night, looked like a staggering drunk. I got up the other night, I was going that way. I really was. I meant to turn that way, and, and, but my body wouldn't do it. My legs wouldn't do it, and I went, woo! And uh, Reba thought I'd been tipping the bottle or something. If my body just does that's what a church is like when they do not abide by the principles of the Word of God that there be an equal sacrifice. And I'm talking about every one of us giving our lives. Can I say this? If you're saved this morning, you ought to be thankful that Jesus saved you from your sin. It ought not be a burden to ask you to give something back to a God who loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son that you'd have eternal life. Hello? Hello? 
go home and sit around and suck on lemon tea all day because you're a lazy Christian when God saved you by His grace. And I'm talking about being faithful to His church. Now I'm going to say this to you this morning. God has no other program in which He receives glory but the local New Testament church. You go home today and you read Ephesians 3.21 which said God gets glory through this church. When we come here today, we are saying back to Him, Lord, we're here today. We're Your people. We've been redeemed by Your grace and we're here to say thank You, Lord, for saving us and to give back to You through the church that You died for. Hello? Equal sacrifice. Now, I've always been the kind of pastor, you, you can verify that when I was here. And in the years, 23 years that I was in Florida, that would do whatever needed to be done. You might find me in the bathroom cleaning toilets. I'm not too good to do that. Any pastor who's too good to, that, to do that has become too good. They need to be willing to do that. You young men remember that as you minister. But I'll tell you this, I remember a time when I was here and I got up in front of the church and said, I'm doing all the mopping and I'm doing all the cleaning and I'm putting up the mop tonight. If you want a filthy, dirty, Baptist temple, then just let it stay filthy, dirty because I'm not going to be the only one to do the work around here. We all need to be equally involved in the stewardship of our lives. Amen. It ought to be true when the choir practices. Say amen, Brother Glenn. Amen. It ought to be true when you go out on soul winning on Saturday morning. It ought to be true on Sunday night when the church meets. Why? Because you're a body. The body is never intended to be bifurcated. It is always to be one and whole. We are to come together as one. Turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. The background of Nehemiah chapter 8 is this. The background of Nehemiah chapter 8 is that Nebuchadnezzar has attacked uh, Jerusalem and he's destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Some of you are trying to find that Nehemiah, aren't you? He's destroyed the city of Jerusalem and uh, as he destroyed uh, the, the city of Jerusalem, he, uh, he left nothing. I mean literally nothing. And the Bible says... In Nehemiah chapter number 8 and verse number 1, just mark these words. The Bible says, they all came together as one. Do you see that there? Mark those words, as one. Now here's what, here's what I have found. You can get everybody to come, look at me. You can get everybody to come. It does not always mean they are as one. You understand what I'm saying here? I've been in churches, oh boy. Woo I've been in churches and you walk in and you can feel that resistant crowd. They're there! But they're not in unity with anybody else. They're not being stewards of their life with everybody else. Are you still with me here? What, what Nehemiah said is, if we're going to rebuild the house, Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed it, we're going to have to clean up all the garbage and rebuild the city of God and reinstitute worship. And when they did that, they all came together as one body, as one people in unity together. I has, there has to be an equality. You, you, can I say this? I'll tell you what's killing our churches today is this lackadaisical spirit that I can do whatever I want to do, go whenever I want to go, tithe whenever I want to tithe, but boy, that preacher better be Johnny on the spot when I need him. He better make sure his calendar's clear when I got something going and I need him. He better be there to bury my dead and marry my fools. Uh, sorry, Brother Joe. It needs to be an equal sacrifice. Amen? First principle is what? Say it with me. Principle of personal surrender. The second principle is the principle of equal sacrifice. Everybody carrying the load. The Bible says it's required of stewards. They be found faithful. Faithful. You know what I believe carrying the load means? It means every member 
needs to get both shoulders under everything that needs to be done at the house of God and equally share in the burden. The second prince, third principle, and then I'll finish for this morning session, is the principle of gathering. The principle of gathering. Look with me in 2 Corinthians, please, and still in chapter number 8 and verse number 15. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over. And he that had gathered little had no lack. Now I just want to tell you what I've, what I've observed, both from the Bible and from knowing people like I've known people. Our church ran in the several hundreds in Tampa. I was around a lot of people. We had almost 600 students in our Christian school, a small college. I'm around people all the time. And here's what I've noticed. Most people are all alike. They're trying to pile up what they've got and keep it for a rainy day. In fact, here's what they'll do. They'll pile all that up and someday they'll die and everybody that's left behind will fight over what they've got. I've had people say to me, oh no, that would never happen in our family. And I just chuckle and I say, well, I hope you're right. But I'm telling you, I'm not counting on it. And they die and sure enough, the verme come out and the battle begins and everybody begins to fight over things. Isn't it amazing how America has become things oriented? I've got to have this and I've got to have that. And we're piling up this money so that we can have everything, everything that we need. And yet God said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father will not be in him. Why? Because you'll be all caught up with loving things and there'll be nothing left to love God with. You don't have to say amen. I can go preach to the choir. But I'm telling you, it's true, isn't it, choir? Amen. Amen. It's true. Here's what I'm saying. You remember that story in Luke chapter 12 about the rich young farmer? Y'all remember that? And he filled up his barn. I can see him now. He's out there looking at that barn. I'd love to get between the verses. He's out there looking at that barn. Maybe some of his workers are around. And he's saying, wow, guys, woo, look at that. We had a bumper crop this year. I'm, I'm from Indiana, where you get all your food. <laughs> Wasn't for our farmers, y'all would be skinny. And boy, you, you'll see those farmers out on the side of the road. And they'll be looking at those fields and that corn is up here, you know. And they know they're going to have what they call a bumper crop. Oh, I'm telling you. I think it's going to be one of those years we're getting good rain right now and I think we're going to have a bumper crop of wheat right now and then of corn later in the summer and I can see them and they're looking at that and, and the farmer said, well, how much room do we have in the barn? And they said, oh, sir, sir, the barn is already full. Oh, we can't allow that. Tear down the barn, he said. We're going to build a bigger barn. And we'll just keep filling it up. Now here's what he could have said. Are you all with me? He could have said, I've got neighbors down the road who need some food and I want to be a good steward. I think I'll send some of the corn down to them. You remember about 10 years ago when there was a glut of milk in the country and the prices went down, the farmers poured all their, all their milk out in the dirt? Not good stewardship, Amen. I mean, I know what they're trying to do, get the price up, but there were babies going to bed at night that didn't have enough milk. That was stupid. But that's what this rich young farmer did. Man, I'm, woo, am I prosperous. Look what I've got. And I'm in control. I must be the best farmer in the valley. Tear that barn down. Or we'll just build a bigger barn. And he did. And they filled it up. But you know what God said? This night thy soul shall be required of thee. And your kids are going to fight over the corn. Now that's not in the Bible, but I know what happened. Because I know people. People are going to fight over what you got. Are you all still with me here this morning? I'm saying to you this morning, you can just gather and gather and gather and gather and have nothing. But you can gather and give based on biblical principle and it will never run out. Amen? I'll give you two illustrations and I'll be done. Elijah, go down to the widow's house 
I mentioned this in my message the other night. And she's going to feed you. She's going to give you that cake. They were going to eat it and die. But the barrel was empty and they can make no more cakes and there is no more meal. What are they going to do? But they obeyed God in their stewardship and they gave according to the word of God to Elijah. And I see that little boy going back to his mama and saying, Mama, Mama, it's the most thrilling thing. You can't believe it. The barrel is full of, of meal and the cruise is full of oil. How can the barrel be full of meal? How can the cruise be full of oil? They, Mama, I tell you, there was nothing there. I scraped every last grain of meal out. I, I poured out every last drop of the oil. But Mama, the cruise is full now. And the barrel is full now. Why? Because when you properly stewardship your life, you will gather and never have any lack though you are constantly giving. But if you get it all and you give nothing back, you know what the Bible says in Malachi chapter 3? He said, if you do the right thing, I will devour. I, I, I will rebuke the devourer who comes and takes your stuff away. I'll keep him away from your corn. I'll keep him away from your meal. I'll keep him away from your oil. And you'll always have plenty in your life. Amen? Four weeks ago, approximately, on a Sunday afternoon, or Saturday afternoon actually, I was with my mom, who is rapidly getting worse medically, and we knew things were getting close. And during the whole time, the one she clung to was Reva, my wife. And even us kids, we kind of took second place to Reva. She'd call on Reva to take care of her and to wash her mouth and do things like that. And I heard her one day saying, as soon as I get out of here, Reva, I want to give you some money. I want you to go get Bruce something. I don't know if she even said what it was or just something. And uh, so later in the day I was with her and she was, she was um, in and out, in and out, in and out. And she woke up for a little while and she said, Bruce, is that you? I said, yeah, Mama, it's me. She said, I, I want to do something for you, but but I really don't have anything right now to do anything for you. And I said, oh, Mama, you've already done something for me. She said, I have. I said, yeah, Mama, you have. She said, what did I do? I said, Mama, first of all, you gave me life. And then when I was six, Mama, you set me up on a high chair and told me, how to trust Jesus as my Savior. And, and I trusted Him as my Savior. Mama, I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I have everything Jesus has. Everything He owns, I own. You don't need to give me anything, Mama. You've already given it to me. Oh, I want to tell you, when this life is over, they carry you off to the funeral home, drain your blood and fill you full of formaldehyde and stick your body six feet below the ground or stick you in the incinerator, whichever way it goes. You're not taking anything with you. You're not taking a thing with you. Naked you came in and naked you're going out. The only thing that you can keep with you in heaven are the treasures you laid up there by proper biblical stewardship. Of your life. But I had this and I owned the farm and I had five cows. And yeah, where are they now? Because the earth is going to be rolled up and burned with a fervent heat. And there's not going to be anything left. So what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Our heads are bowed, please. The first principle is the principle of a surrendered